Welcome to Ghostly. Is King Tut's tomb cursed? Ghostly is a podcast that comes out every other week. In each episode, we take a ghost story or paranormal event and look into its complete history. Rebecca then gives us evidence proving that the story is real, and my job is to debate those pieces of evidence and get you, the listener, prepared to vote on if it's real or not. If you haven't yet, please hit that subscribe button. And as always, we're your host. I'm Pat. And I'm Rebecca. And I'm going to say that three... Is King Tut's tomb curse? King Tut's tomb. <sighs> King Tut's tomb curse. King Tut's yeah. tomb curse. Or the curse of King Tut's tomb. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> <laughs> that makes it harder. <laughs> curse of King Tut's tomb. Yeah. Oh, and I don't even know if I said that three times. <laughs> I don't know what would come out at the end. All right. All right. Well, just let's just say King King Tut right now. Yes. And so we're going to be going back in time. I don't think we've done an episode from this time period or before this even. I mean, this is this is BC. Yeah, this is this is definitely uh some of this will be BC. Yeah. Some of them some, some of them is more current, but Sure, sure. But yeah, no, this is this is fun. We're we're going a, we're going in a different area. We we spent a lot of time in Paris. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Which is fun. But now we're ready yeah. for something totally different. We're talking curses, number one. Yeah. I always like when we do a cur- good old curse instead I, of a just ghosties. I don't ghosties. like them as much, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, I I enjoy the history of this. This is, um, I, I mean, I learned a lot of stuff doing, doing the history for this, so. Yeah. I mean, I, there's like the real old history and then there's the like history of mo- how we yeah. made the history. Yeah. It's all interesting. Yeah, absolutely. So this would be the part where we would do shout outs on Ghostly. There's two ways to get a shout out on Ghostly. We have neither of them again today. Nobody's given us a review on Apple Podcast and we don't have any new Patreon. So if you're out there and you're thinking about either one of those, do so. And if you don't have any money and still want to help support us, share us with friends and family. That's a great way to do it. Um, Like us if you can on the socials and uh, on the YouTubes and everything like that. Absolutely. This is uh, spooky season is coming close. This is the time of yes. year when people are interested in listening to the spooky stuff. So um, hopefully you will share and have fun. We got a lot of episodes coming up. We, yeah. we just kind of put together our schedule and I'm excited for it. Sure. And, you know, we met a lot of people at Fan Expo. We were just at Fan Expo um, Chicago. And um, we met a lot of people, and they told us stories, and we asked them to email them to us, but we do not have those stories yet. So we do not have listener mail again this week. We do not. So um, if you have anything, yeah, we definitely would love to hear it. And yes, shout out to those people that came up and said hi. Yeah. At Fan I, Expo Chicago. I really enjoyed meeting everyone and seeing seeing faces, familiar faces that we saw in the years past, too. Absolutely. And all the new people. It yeah. was a lot of fun. Absolutely. And of course, special shout out to Jack Chavez for coming on our live ghostly episode. The man the man who knows everything. The man who knows everything. And of course, very special Bob After Dark. Yeah, absolutely. Bob was fantastic too. But just to um just to say something about Jack Mm. is in the middle of us doing our panel, (laughs) I decided to ask him if there was any cryptids in, in that area. This is not scripted, folks. He did not he, know you were going to ask him this. He did not know, but he did not miss a beat. And he was and, like, yeah, yeah, there's this, there's this, and this. <laughs> like, oh my God, you know, he really is the man who knows everything. He is. So uh, don't worry if you missed our live show because, uh, well, it's a different topic. We will likely be bringing Jack 
back. Yes. For the Halloween season. Absolutely. That is We're our intention. Really excited about that. So, uh, we, uh, again, lo- that's just one piece of your, our exciting plans. Absolutely. Um, so, if you want to send us a ghost story, you can email us at info at ghostlypodcast.com or use the contact us form on ghostlypodcast.com. Uh, another one of our favorite ways to get ghost stories is through the actual mail. You can uh, send it to P.O. Box number 264, Geneva, Illinois, 60134. And as I always say, you're not writing this down as I'm talking. You're not taking notes. And if you are, that's kind of weird. But um, but, but I, okay. <laughs> but okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, but if you want that information and you know, you're done listening to this and you can't remember what I said, just go to ghostlypodcast.com, scroll to the footer and all the information's in the footer. Absolutely. All right. So in our last episode, we talked about Notre Dame. Yes, we did. No, I'm not going to sing this. In Paris. And we had... Patty. Um, So yes, 56%. Mm -hmm. No, 44%. Yes. Yeah. And the overall rating was 3.8. Wow. So, so. I mean, that's decent. Yeah. It's not yeah. the most haunted that we've seen. Yeah, but not but not the least. Um, yeah. You know, not the most, but not the least. So. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that was our last uh, Petty episode for now. Yeah. Uh, you never know. We certainly could head back there. Um, but if you would like to vote on this episode that you're listening to mm-hmm. right now. Yes. You can go to ghostlypodcast.com and click on polls. Absolutely. Or go to ghostlypodcast.com slash polls. Yeah. You can can do that too. And whatever you'd like to do. um, And then your voice could be heard for the next episode. Yeah. The only only thing you can't do is whisper it to Rebecca. Um, That doesn't work. Rebecca tries all the time to tell me that people are, you know, (laughs) voting in her ear. Um, But I I will not accept that. I'm sorry. You have to actually go on the form and vote. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I do have a ghost story. Okay. It's time for a spooky tale from Rebecca. I have seen things. Things that most will never see, except in a museum. I am the Inspector General of Antiquities for the Egyptian government. As part of my wonderful job, I get to enter tombs of the pharaohs. Some might see my job as dangerous. It is well known that many tombs carry curses to help keep plunderers away, Priests who served the pharaoh would write these curses on the walls or objects in a tomb before closing it. This was to ensure rivals and locals would suffer the consequences if they dared to enter. But what about now, thousands of years later? Are these curses still in effect? I believe sometimes they are, especially if those entering the tomb do so with only their own glory and riches in their minds. One example of this is the tomb of King Tut. I was with the group of people who found and entered this tomb for the first time. I warned them to keep clear their minds before going in, to remember that we must honor the dead and respect them, otherwise they will suffer the consequences. This is how I have stayed safe over these years. But some did not listen. One man, the money man financing this search, was in a very high spirits when we found King Tut's tomb. He said something about how he was going to plan to hold a concert in the sepulchre. I told him and everyone there, if he goes down in that spirit... I give him six weeks to live. Ended up taking a little bit longer than six weeks, but he did die within the year. Remember, you must respect the dead. All right, Rebecca, how much of this is based on fact? All of it. All of it. Well, I mean, now. 
Somebody Did said he say, if he goes down in that spirit. Yes. That is an exact quote wow. from the guy who was the. I don't understand that quote. If he goes down in that spirit, I give him six like weeks to live. The spirit of like. Oh, in that spirit. Like, okay, like gotcha. his, his emotions. Gotcha. Okay. Yes. I'm thinking of like a ghost. I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. So, no, this is uh, this was the real guy who was, who, you know, uh, worked for the, uh, who was the inspector general. And, yeah. and that's supposedly what he says. It was in a newspaper article. I got to get my mind on curse and not ghost curse. for a little bit. Yes, a little different. Again, <laughs> it's, it's nice to do something a little different. I like, yep. I like it. Well, uh, when we return, we're going to get to the history. get into the pat facts. Pat facts. So King Tut or Tutankhamun was an Egyptian pharaoh between uh, 1334 and 1325 BC. So the reason why the numbers are flipped around than we used to <laughs> hear is because this is before Christ. BC. Or, or CE is the yeah. other term yeah, yeah. we'll use today. Common error. Absolutely. Era. <laughs> um, it was towards the end of the 18th dynasty, but during the New Kingdom uh, period, if you're into Egyptian periods. I mean, if you really want to blow your mind, and I don't know enough about this to actually get into any detail at all, but there is a thing, and it is like true or something, that we are like closer to Cleopatra in time frame than like the early Egyptians were to Cleopatra. I don't oh, know. interesting. They were around for wow. so long yeah the they Egyptians, were they were that we it's it's hard to comprehend yeah 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 like look that up it's it's crazy wow um so king tut was known as the boy king after the previous pharaoh who we believe was his father died uh his father who we believe was his father <laughs> radically reshaped ancient egypt by worshiping only one deity Aten. Mm. Uh, one of King Tut's major acts was the restoration of traditional religious practice. So he went back to, you know, believing in multiple gods. Like Ra or what, all the things that we yeah, hear. Yeah, yeah, and Ta. Yes. Yeah, and everything that rhymes with those. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, so shortly after King Tut took power, he commissioned a full-size royal tomb in the Valley of the Kings, which was probably one of two tombs from that same era. Okay. Um, although he was not placed in his own tomb, he was placed in what was believed to be a non-royal tomb after he died prematurely. The tomb was enlarged to accommodate his burial. Now, it's possible that the king after him actually usurped King Tut in order to gain his tomb, which was very nice for a pharaoh, even. <laughs> Now, I mean, I did not, I don't know where I saw this and it was years ago and I didn't mm -hmm. find it this time, but I had read somewhere once that like there had been um, like a, a, a prophecy that mm. King Tut would be the, the biggest and most famous, you know, pharaoh of all time and that whoever took his place like had maybe arranged for his death or, mm. you know, I don't know, something because they didn't want that prophecy to become true. Yeah, but who would have thought it would be, you know, almost 3,000 years after he died that he became the most popular? I mean, this is what happens when you try to, like, thwart something like that, right? Uh, like yeah. the prophecy, you're going to make it come true. Because yeah. well, we'll learn more about what happens to where he was buried, but it there's it's interesting. <laughs> so within a few years of King Tut's burial, his tomb was robbed not once but twice. After the first robbery, officials responsible for its security repaired and repacked some of the damaged goods before filling the outer corridor with chips of limestone, uh, along with objects dropped by the thieves to deter future thieves from coming in it is interesting to think about like i i don't know that i had thought of like i always thought of like tomb robberies have happening like 
like more recent, yeah. right? I mean, not yeah, yeah. you know, like a hundred years ago or something like that. But like, if you think about it, I mean, man, these pharaohs, super rich. They're like, yep, bury me with all my gold, bury yeah. me with all my stuff, yeah, right? Because animals, I, animals, take, yep. wives, whatever, taking yep. it all with me, put it in, put it in there with me. Um, why would you think then that that wasn't gonna get robbed? Yeah, you know, uh-huh. I mean, of course, people are people, man. They're gonna be like, listen. So, what should we be? <laughs> you and I should get along so easily. People are people. <laughs> uh, anyways, yeah, um, it's crazy. And I thought that, like, going into King Tut's uh, tomb was kind of like an episode, like, of the Goonies. Oh, where sure. Where it was super sure. hard and you yeah. had to play stuff on an organ to get right. in and stuff. <laughs> exactly. Right. Younger listeners probably don't know what I'm talking about. Well, you know, any kind of, you know, thing where, you know, you have to, to do certain things in order to get through. Like there were a lot of uh, booby traps. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Well, there wasn't that many here, actually. Ah, okay. So they didn't really do that much to thwart out the people. Wow. Uh, uh, yeah. So they knew this was going to happen probably, but they didn't. Yeah. They didn't really care, I guess. Yeah. Uh, nevertheless, nevertheless, a second set of robbers burrowed through the corridor, um, and this robbery, too, was detected. And after a second hasty restoration of the tomb, it was once again sealed, this time forever. Okay. So the Valley of the Kings is subject to uh, periodic flash floods that deposit alluvium, mm-hmm. uh, which is a gravel of sorts. Okay. It's, like a, it's like a soot. That yeah, 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 everything. like a silt or something. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, the the geologist Stefan Cross has argued that a major flood deposited this layer after King Tut's tomb was last sealed, making it next to impossible for people the day to get in. Ah, uh-huh. and good job, King Tut's tomb, King. Tut's tomb. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, now there are people that are argue that that happened more recent. Mm. Um, or that it happened before he was buried, but um, there's no way to be sure. So we're yeah. just going to go with um, Stephen Cross. Well, it makes sense, though, because, you know, I mean, this this was uh, something that was kind of preserved. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, you have to, like, think about the times, too. Um, we don't know many details of King Tut's existence because, um, first of all, they didn't even know if he was real. Mm-hmm. Because they had saw his name, but they had never found any kind of body or anything like well, that. Well, he wasn't Pharaoh for very long. Was no, he? he wasn't. Yeah. No. Um, okay, so several tombs in the Valley of the Kings lay open continuously from ancient times on onward. Mm. But the entrances to many others remained hidden until after the emergence of Egyptology in the early 19th century. Many of the remaining tombs were found by a series of excavators working for Theodore Davis from 1902 to 1914. Under Davis, most of the valley was explored, although he never found King Tut's tomb because he thought no tomb would have been cut into the valley floor. Ah, okay. So after Davis gave up on um, the work in the valley, the archaeologist Howard Carter and his um, patron, George Herbert, who was the fifth Earl of Carnav- Carnivan, um, made an effort to clear the Valley of Debris down to the bedrock. Davis's finds of artifacts bearing King Tut's name gave them reason to hope that they might find his tomb one day. So the discovery began on November 4th, 1922, with a single step at the top of the entrance staircase. When the excavators reached the antechamber on November 26th, it exceeded all expectations, providing unprecedented insight into what a new kingdom royal burial was like. All right, I found a quote okay. um, from Howard Carter mm-hmm. uh, when he first saw the tomb. As my eyes grew accustomed to the light, details of the room within emerged slowly from the mist. Strange animals, statues, and gold. Everywhere the glint of gold. For the moment, an eternity, it must have seemed to the other standing by, I was struck dumb with amazement. And when Lord Carnarvon... (laughs) <laughs> Sorry. It's a hard one. It's a hard one when Lord Carnarvon. 
Car- Carnarvon, yeah, there yeah. You go. unable to stand the suspense any longer, inquired anxiously, can you see anything? It was all I could do to get out the words, yes, wonderful things. Oh, and that's from Howard Carter? Yes. All right, so the condition of the burial goods um, varied greatly. Many had been profoundly affected by moisture, which is, I mean, you would think moisture would... Um, bring life into stuff, but it actually corrodes and <laughs> well, it actually <laughs> destroys things. <laughs> sure. Um, and it probably derived from both the damp state of the plaster when the tomb was first sealed and from water seepage over the, you know, thousands of years until it was excavated. Yeah. I mean, you said it was, you know, in in the floor of the bedrock. Yeah. So, I mean, we know, I mean, anyone has a basement. Yeah, knows. exactly. So this was, an, this was a basement tomb. Yeah. Um, recording the tomb's contents and conser- conserving them so that they could survive to be transported to Cairo uh, proved to be an unprecedented task, lasting for 10 digging seasons. Wow. Yeah. Um, the spectacular nature of the tomb's goods inspired a media frenzy, <laughs> dubbed Tut- uh, Tutmania, that made King Tut into one of the most famous pharaohs of all time. Exactly. Prophecy correct. <laughs> <laughs> the publicity in- increased when Carnivarn uh, died of an infection in April 1923, inspiring rumors that he had been killed by a curse on the tomb. Oh, we're going to be talking about it. <laughs> His name is too hard to pronounce, though, so maybe we should just <laughs> skip over him. After Carnivarn's death, the tomb clearance continued until Carter's leadership. In the second season of the process, in um, late 1923 and early 1924, the antechamber was emptied and artifacts and work began on the burial chamber itself. The excavators opened and removed Uh, King Tut's coffin and mummy in 1925, then spent the next few seasons working on the treasury and the annex. And the clearance of the tomb itself was completed in November of 1930, Uh, though Carter and Lucas continued to work on conserving the remaining burial goods until February 1932, when the last shipment was sent to Cairo. Wow. So there is some time that passed in between that, and that was because... Um, suddenly, with all the media frenzy, mm. Egypt got a little weird about things. They were like, sure. you can't do this. This is against the law, which they didn't really have a law. Yeah, but makes sense, though. And so uh, Carter said, okay, well, we're not going to touch anything then. And then they wouldn't get the stuff in Cairo because it needed to be documented in such a way um, that yeah, they weren't able precise, to do. Yeah. That they weren't able to do. Besides that, they didn't have the knowledge. Mm-hmm. So um, after a couple of years, Egypt just gave in because mm-hmm. they wanted the stuff in Cairo to make money on it. Sure. Um, the tomb has been a popular tourist destination ever since the clearance process. The 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 clearance process began. Sometime after the mummy was reinterred in 1926, someone broke into the sarcophagus. <gasps> Stealing objects Carter had left in place. Oh, whoever that thief is. Dirty thief. Dirty thief. Uh, the Society of Friends of the Royal Tombs of Egypt suggested the idea of creating a replica of King Tut's tomb in 1988 so that the tourist could see it without further damaging the original. Smart. So, um, interesting thing. This is the Chicago Connection. Mm-hmm. The Field Museum was one of six in- institutions in the United States chosen to host an incredible traveling exhibition in 1977. Its 55 objects once belonged to the young King Tut, whose tomb was discovered 100 years ago that November. Um, the exhibit idea was formed during the administration of President Richard Nixon, who wanted the American people to associate Egypt with something more than oil and water, according to the National Endowment for <laughs> the Humanities. Uh, and it did come back again, too. Yeah. Um, but un- unlike his possessions, King Tut himself did not make the trip to Chicago. Um, he was busy. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. His, his mummy remained in the Valley of the Kings outside of Luxor, uh, Egypt. 
Do you have anything to add to the history? I was going to say, like, I, I feel like I remember hearing about King Tut coming to Chicago, but yeah, I mean, I w- it was I mean, must they, have been they did bring him back in two thousand seven. Okay, maybe that's what I'm remembering. Yeah, then. so almost twenty years ago, and there is a um, there is an Egypt uh, exhibit there yes. as well. Yes, there is. Um, so yeah, that you can. Definitely take a look at. Yeah, so, it's it's really interesting. It's cool. And um, some of the things are replicas, I believe, though. I don't I'm believe sure. that all of it is exact. These things are millions of dollars. You know, each each artifact is Absolutely. worth that much. So Yeah, definitely. Well, yeah, like I said, I just always was fascinated by this idea that, like, in trying to, you know, uh, make sure that he wasn't the most famous pharaoh, they ended up, you Making know, b- make, pushing yeah. him to this, like, lesser known um burial tomb, tomb yeah. and then which then therefore man you know man it, whatever managed to get covered in this silt and that was preserved and then yeah. that's what made him the most popular because his didn't get robbed again like i i love that I it's kind that. of crazy history it's just um and there's so much there's so much more to this this could you know easily be a like a trilogy movie you know or something like that with all the stuff that happened during absolutely during well i mean and we know there's plenty there are um plenty of movies out there i think that might be also something that has makes you think like oh all all the you know pharaoh's tombs are all these traps and weird you know weird things you know once you start watching all these movies they do a lot of fun stuff absolutely um and actually i believe king tut's remains were um like they've done like analysis of them okay and he's actually still pretty small too he's well i think he was a kid right he was he was a boy king but he was king for a while though okay Um, so he was he was um for 11 years. So okay. he was 10 years old. So he was 21. Yeah. So. When that happened. But there, there's like all kinds of things about like what kind of injuries that he had and stuff. Yeah. And it's amazing when you look into some of the stuff. It's I mean, There was a lot of stuff that happened mm-hmm. uh, after you know, he was put in this tomb. There you go. Yeah. All right. So um, we're going to take a short break. And when we return, I think Rebecca's got some evidence, some small stuff. You bet I do. All right. So we're going to talk about that then. Rebecca, it's time for a debate. Let's do this. All right. Okay. Let's go. (laughs) So ever since King Tut's tomb was discovered in Egypt's Valley of the King, um, stories started to circulate, as you Mm -hmm. mentioned, right? Um, That those who dared violate the boy king's final resting place faced a terrible curse. Though not as dramatic as a murderous mummy like the movie... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it is wide, widely claimed that many people associated with opening the tomb soon fell victim to the curse, mm. uh, often dying under mysterious circumstances. Okay. So I'm going to do my best to kind of maybe like group some things and some situations attributed to this this curse. Yeah, you said there's 10 total. Right? Yeah, there's like 10 people and sometimes there's more, sometimes there's less. Obviously, we're not going to go through each one of the 10. You're going you know, to... Gonna... You're going to cherry pick them. I'm going to cherry pick them and yeah. then include one thing that's like more of an associated. Thing. Okay. Okay. So uh, as we already have talked about, probably mm-hmm. the most famous death associated with the tomb is that of Howard Carter's financier, uh, the fifth Earl. Wait, we're not in Paris anymore. What did, but some words are just like. <laughs> <laughs> the fifth Earl of Carnarvon, George Herbert. Okay. And actually, he has like 50 names, but I just <laughs> <laughs> shortened it to George Herbert. Yeah. Um, so he Geo. Got- <laughs> shortened it even more, just Geo. There you go. Um, 
old Herbert. Mm -hmm. (laughs) He died on March 25th, 1923, about a year after the tomb was opened. Mm -hmm. The idea that his death came from the curse was promoted by newspapers and even Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who was the writer of Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. Doyle told the American press that, quote, an evil elemental spirit created by priests to protect the mummy could have caused his death. Mm. Um, legend has it that when Lord, uh, okay, we're just going to call him George Herbert, that when George Herbert Gio. Died, Gio died, all the lights in his house, or according to some accounts, all the lights in Cairo mysteriously went out. Mm. Um, and all of this was after Weigel, that's who was the uh, man of my story earlier. Oh, okay. All this was after his prediction. Okay. That he was going to die. Yes. Hmm. So, I've done some research into him, too. And um, I t- there was something about, like, he had a mosquito bite that he uh, decided he was going to pick at. Um, and it opened up while he was shaving and ended up dying of blood poisoning shortly thereafter. Um, so, like, this is something that can happen, especially when you're out there, you know. You're exposed to the elements out there. And these are not elements that most of us are familiar with. This is desert, you know? <laughs> the desert does bad things to people. Oh, I see. So, uh, you know, I don't think it's an evil elemental, even though Sir, <laughs> Sir Arthur Conan Doyle said it is. Um, you know, it's kind of weird that a writer would come up with such an elaborate story. <laughs> Zero, Rebecca. Zero. Wow, wow. I'm gonna give this one a. Uh, I'm gonna give it a six. A six. Right okay. now, here's the thing. I'm sure that that whole mosquito thing is true. But, but by the way, I don't like Sir Arthur Conan Doyle because <gasps> he had bad things to say about Chicago when he was here. Oh, that is true. I do love Sherlock, though. Yeah, but I hate what he said about Chicago. Yeah. All right. Um. I mean, here's the thing. Even if, let's say, mosquito bite thing is, in fact, what happened, right? Mm-hmm. Still could be a curse, right? Bad luck. I mean, it could right? be, yeah. Other people, other people could have had that same bite from something else. But hmm. because he's cursed, bad stuff's going to happen. So I, I think I gave it a six. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now, another interesting death of someone who was also another one of the first to enter the tomb is that of Richard Bethel. Okay. Bethel was, what do we say, Geo's (laughs) secretary and the first person behind Carter to enter the tomb. He died in 1929 under suspicious circumstances. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, some people have even said he was connected to Al- uh, Alistair Crowley, which we've mentioned before, but we haven't dived into. But basically, he was found smothered in his room at an elite London gentleman's club. Hmm. Soon after, the Nottingham Evening Post suggested the suggestion that the Honorable Richard Bethel has come under the curse was raised last year. When there was a mysterious, when there was a series of mysterious fires at his home, where some of the priceless finds from uh, Tutankhamun's tomb were stored, so basically they're saying like he died under mysterious circumstances, and he had had a bunch of fires at his house the year before, where things that he took from the tomb were stored. Um, <laughs> so it's attributed to. Lester Crowley, mm-hmm. which Lester Crowley, um, you know, there's some people that actually um, believe in stuff that he said, but um, Lester Crowley went in and took over a coven, mm-hmm. right? And um, then he said that a high priestess needed to be pretty, pretty much. This is uh, <laughs> like a summary of what he said. And that when they got older, they had to step down. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, given the man saying something like that, um, I don't know. And, um, he said that he was smothered in his room. Uh, that, no, I'm not buying this. I'm going to say zero on this one. I'm going to say that the reason why people are attributing this is because, uh, all these people died around that time, but also a lot of events happened around that time. They got a lot of money. 
Mm. They got a lot of fame and a lot of notoriety. And people that are like child stars, when they grow up, you know, and if they have money still, they ruin their whole lives because of stuff like that. So I'm going to say, no, this is not true. And I'm going to give it a zero. Wow. Okay. Well, I'm going to give this one, I'm going to give this one a seven. Seven. I mean, okay. he's got fires happening and then he dies mysteriously in a hotel room. Again, that he had too seven. much money for his own good. <laughs> All right. Next one. Mm-hmm. Hugh Evelyn White, a British archaeologist, visited King Tut's tomb and may have helped excavate the site. By 1924, after seeing death sweep over about two dozen of his fellow excavators, I'm not sure where that fact came from, but that was what it said. Evelyn White died by suicide, but not before writing, allegedly in his own blood, I have succumbed to a curse which forces me to disappear. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so there was a news article (laughs) from uh, September 13th, 1924, which reported Mr. Evelyn White, an Egyptologist at Leeds University and who worked in the Valley of the Kings, shot himself in a taxi cab. In his letters, he stated he was under a curse for removing certain ancient writings from Egypt. Okay. So these people believed they were cursed. Yeah. But I mean, so they probably, during this day, they probably heard tale that you could be cursed, you know, opening these things up. He's opened up a lot. So we are saying that um, King Tut's in particular caused this to happen. So no, I'm not going to, I mean, he did not say that himself. He just said that he was under a curse. And also too, there's no... Proof that he was actually there may have helped ex- excavate it. <laughs> There's no proof he was even there. I Just because he knew about it. To a <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if he didn't kill himself, he wouldn't have succumbed to the. So, like, I don't understand how he can write that before he died. Like, what was the curse doing to him? Well, it was just pushing him to do such a thing. Okay. It sounds like a book that we just read. Um, in the book club. So I'm going to give this one a zero. <laughs> I'm this one's giving this one a, a seven. Giving it a seven as well. Uh, you know, this guy, he, he said it. He said, this is why I did it. Because I was under the curse. Yeah. Uh, what if it was the curse of, of his ex-wife or something? <laughs> he didn't say what the curse was or anything. Well, no, he said that in his letters. It's come to a curse which forces me to disappear. That's all. <laughs> well, no, in the in the uh, in the article, the oh, newspaper okay. article, it said that he wrote he was under a curse for removing certain ancient writings. Now, I okay. mean, maybe he was uh, going to be under arrest. I don't, I don't know. But yeah, oh I yeah, mean. that probably would would come true. Yeah. So the curse was the police. Law and order was his curse. Justice. No zero. <laughs> okay, seven. All right. Uh, another one here, uh, Aaron Ember, mm-hmm. who was an American Egyptologist. Mm. Um, he was friends with many of the people who were present when King Tut's tomb was opened, including our geo. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lord Carnival, George Herbert uh, Ember died in 1926 when his house in Baltimore burned it down in less than an hour after he and his wife hosted a dinner party he could have exited safely but his wife encouraged him to save a manuscript he'd been working on while <laughs> she went to get their son oh my god <laughs> sadly they and the family's maid died in the catastrophe the name of the manuscript the Egyptian book of the dead <laughs> okay, but he didn't even, he wasn't even there. Well, he was friends with them. So he wasn't there. But I'm guessing he maybe got some of their stuff. Their, it rubbed off on them. Then anybody that about. they came in contact with would have been cursed. There, so we I'm wouldn't not be here all now. all the people, but there are more like that. We wouldn't be here now because it would have rubbed off on every single living person, especially traveled from Egypt all the way to no, America. Only if you're trying to make money on it. <laughs> Everyone's trying to make money on everything. Haven't you seen the Charmed episode? Where <laughs> sorry, there's no, but I did people... see the Brady Bunch episode where they did <laughs> find the the little statue thing, and uh, that was a curse, uh-huh. and that caused a tarantula to go up Bobby's leg. I think. Okay. I can't remember for sure exactly what happened, but something <laughs> like that. Zero 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 zero. All right, this one I give a five. 
Okay, a five. <laughs> so what does a five mean to you, though? A five Rebecca? means to me, like, maybe. Maybe not, but maybe. Okay, so five is like your middle ground. My middle ground. My middle ground is zero. Yeah. Because everything gets a zero. That's the difference. <laughs> All right, I got one more. Okay. Now, this is, again, a little bit different, right? Okay. I wanted to pull some different ones in here, not just, you know, this person died, because there's a lot of this person died, okay? Mm-hmm. Um, but this is actually two instances of plays mm. being cursed because they were related to King Tut. Uh-huh. So uh, there was a newspaper article, January 12th, 1925, a review skit about Queen Nefertiti, who supposedly was uh, King Tut's mother-in-law was canceled after various unfortunate events befell the cast and crew, including actors falling sick. The cast believed this was the fault of the curse and successfully lobbied the management of the theater to not do the play. Okay. Then March 9th, 1934. So almost 10 years later, Louis Siggins wrote a play about the ominous death surrounding King Tut's tooth. Tomb, and he, Louis Siggins, dies suddenly. Strangely, a week preceding his death, the producer of the play received a disturbing call in which an anonymous source predicted Siggins' death. The play was, of course, canceled for fear of further repercussions, much like the earlier Curse of King Tut's show. Okay, so, okay, we are talking about now. We are talking about a play that was done about about the queen, not even about King Tut. Well, the first one, yeah. Yeah, so adjacent to that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there was another one? And then, then somebody else was trying to write a play that was about uh, this curse, and okay. then he died. Okay, so let's, okay. So people die every day, Rebecca. I don't know if you're aware of this. People die every single day. For various different reasons, I would say probably, you know, 10%, 20% of those deaths are people going, wow, that's really weird. (laughs) (laughs) All right, let's quote it. Pat says about 10% of all deaths are really weird. Yeah. No, they say, wow, that was really weird. People say that about the deaths. Um, but was it weird? No, they died. I mean, that's one of our promises when, when we're born is that we're going to die one day. Mm-hmm. It's actually a gift given to us uh-huh. so that we, you know, if we live forever, there's a bunch of fantasy novels about that. If we live forever, we would just go crazy and we would end up hating everybody because we'd be around everybody all the time and life wouldn't be precious. So we would just, you know, be willy nilly about it. Anyways, zero. This okay. play, the play about the play, that's that's just going crazy. And then the one play was not even about King Tut. Well, but it was about his mother-in-law. And everybody <laughs> got sick. It wasn't good. It wasn't good. And so then they decided not to do it. And then when somebody writes directly about it, what about it if they got each other sick? sick? And it, it goes to death. What about if they got each other sick? You know, it was a cold or some stomach virus that they gave to each other and they all died because of that. I don't know, they were all convinced it was a curse. Okay, so so then what you are saying then is by us doing this episode, we are surely cursed and we're going to die. I don't know. If if we do it with a good heart, maybe not. I I, I don't have a good heart. (laughs) It's a risk we're taking. (laughs) My heart is old. (laughs) Yeah, you haven't had that replaced yet. No, I haven't. I need a replacement (laughs) for that now. No, I mean, this is ridiculous, Rebecca. Just come on with this I'm giving it a six. (laughs) I'm giving it a zero. I mean, that's it. So um, what is your overall rating, Rebecca? (laughs) All right. So I had a couple sevens, a couple sixes, and a five, I think. So uh, I'll say six. All right. All Six right. for the curse. What, what's yours? Zero. <laughs> Big surprise. <laughs> uh, that brings us to the closing ar- arguments. This is our last chance to convince you to vote our way. We are each given one minute of uninterrupted time. We will time each other on our cell phones to keep each other honest, Rebecca. Pat. Are you ready? Yes. And go. All right. There's at least 10 deaths directly associated with going into the tomb and taking stuff, okay? Uh, And then there's more with people that either got the stuff later or um, are just associated with it, right? 
Um, I, you know, there's a positive thing about this like prophecy and it being whatever, but then there's this, there's this curse where if you find the things and if you take them without, um, goodness in your heart, you know, uh, if you're, if you're, if you're not respecting King Tut, bad stuff happens, bad stuff happens. And, you know, it may look like it's natural, but it's bad because you did bad. <laughs> That's all I can say. All right. All right. Rebecca, this is ridiculous. All right, let's go. You ready? Yes. Okay, here we go. Okay, we did an episode about Robert the Doll, which I did not ask Robert permission to do the episode. So I was supposedly cursed, but I took this curse face face on. I was like, I'm going to do this. This is what I'm doing. And I was not cursed. I've lived a happy life since then. Things have been great since then. In fact, just got a kidney, you know, not cursed at all. This isn't cursed at all. There is no curses unless you believe in curses. When you start believing in curses, then you start bringing them upon yourself. You start bringing bad things to happen to you and everything bad that happens to you in your life, you associate with that. Um, This was a very interesting time period because in America, 1920s, 1930s, that's the Great Depression. A lot of people died and a lot of people died around the world. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's all I got to say about that. All right. So I want to thank everyone so much for listening. Uh, Please share us with your friends and family as word of mouth is our best advertisement. Remember to hit that subscribe button uh, if you haven't done so yet. In fact, you know, what are you waiting for? Hit it now. Yeah. I'm going to wait. Subscribe. Okay. You hit it? Okay, good. Uh, I want to give a shout out to some of our VIP producers. We have Andrew. Alicia. Becky, Cindy, Kevin, Jessica, Alice, Aaron, Hope, and Candy. And on the next episode of Ghostly, we're going to be talking about Emily's Bridge in Vermont. And it comes out on September 11th. Yeah, this is the we're cursed go- day. We're going back. Well, we're, no, 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 we're not going into that, but we're going back <laughs> to ghosts is what we're doing. Yeah, good. Good old fashioned ghosties. Good. We're, we're I, I ghosties. Know, ghosties. <laughs> I. Is that what you want to call ghostly now? Is ghosties? No, it's ghostly. Oh. When on ghostly, we talk about ghosties. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I am so excited for the next couple of months. Yeah, we've really we've been locking down guests. We've yes. been locking down um, episode ideas, and I think I think we got some good some good stuff. Actually, really through the end of the year. Yeah. Yeah. So um, maybe we should unveil right now <gasps> what our episodes are going to be about. We do themed episodes for October. Yes. We're going to be talking about haunted airports. I mean, that sounds silly. I'm not going to lie. When you say haunted airport, for some reason to me, you're like, what? No people. 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 <laughs> There's some haunted airports out there. Are they cursed? I, I, they, some of them could be. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry because I know it's good. We're going to be going into holiday travel season. Uh, but hopefully there'll be a, a month in there for you to get over that before you have to do that. Uh, but no, haunted airports. And what do we do in October? How many episodes are we giving them? We're going to, we're going to do four episodes, four. even though there's five potential weeks we could do episodes. We are still going to take the first week of October off because otherwise it would be like seven episodes in a row (laughs) for us. We need a little bit of a break so we can get things recorded for you. Yeah, exactly. uh, But we're so excited, so excited. Uh, And like I said, some good guests, some some good fun things happening um, for the spookies. Oh, and I also wanted to mention um, I'll be sending out my email for our next book club. Mm. Uh, coming up in October. We already picked the book. We already picked the book. We're gonna so people that were in the last book club um meeting mm-hmm. know what the book is. Yes. Um, and if you would like to know what the book club book is going to be, and you are not already signed up for the book club emails, you can go on our ghostlypodcast dot com. So wait, what do we do at the book club? Oh, good question. So at the book club we all read a book beforehand mm-hmm. right and we we meet up on zoom so super easy to get to yeah uh we send you the link and everything and it's just us sitting there talking about the book we and, have so and our much opinions fun. and our opinions about it and things we joke we like we joke we around like. a lot yeah absolutely um and you get to read something hopefully spooky Right, I mean, we, you know, we try. Now, do you our best. have to drink wine while you're 
in the book no, club. No, but you can. But you can. But you absolutely If you are of age. Can, if you are of age. Um, we so don't you, condone <laughs> underage drinking here. So mostly. You, uh, that's very true. Um, but anyone can join the book club. So uh, if you go to ghostlypodcast.com slash book club, or easier maybe is to go to ghostlypodcast.com, go to find us and choose book club. And that is where you'll see, uh, I haven't updated it with the next book yet, but I will soon. Um, and you'll get to, uh, there's a little form to fill out and mm-hmm. that will get you signed up for the email list to join us. Can you put out a social media um, post? I can. Asking people to join. That's a really great idea. Maybe the day that. after this episode comes out. So Thursday. Uh, yes. Great idea. Okay. Until next time, or until the book club, stay ghostly. Bye.